in full screen mode now? Uh, yes, yes, now it's great. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, uh, BG and Lars, for inviting me uh, to give such a, a presentation about uh, data analysis techniques. So, in this talk, I will um, mainly talk about Hog plus data, but also uh, mention at some point uh, synergies with other telescope and other archival data. And I will present so different methods uh, that can be used to analyze the many fields, but also the green alignment and the screen characteristics, giving uh, references and examples. So first, a short introduction with uh, a concerning hot plus observation. So uh, four uh, band uh, were offered uh, to for, for a few cycles, the band A, C, and D, and E, covering the extent of the fine for it, from 53 to 214 microns. And um, I'll let Dave uh, more explain more about the, the different modes. Uh, but the, the idea of, 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 of polarization has been already uh, touched on by, by, by Martin. Uh, I'll uh, mention in this talk uh, the disc quantities, polarization intensity, uh, fraction, and angle um, derived from the, the full stocks parameter maps that are uh, ultimately that are generated by the pipeline. So in this case, in this talk, I will uh, mainly focus on dust polarization. Uh, so, because dust are asymmetric and eventually achieve internal al al alignment, and as well as external external alignment, we obtain uh, linear polarization from their thermal dust emission. And if the if the alignment axis of dust grains is in the plane of the sky, as uh, as uh, highlighted here, uh, the polarization fraction obtained is maximum, and it is nil when the uh, alignment axis is. Uh, in line site. So the, 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 the polarization signal we obtain is um, results from a direct integration in the line of sight and is sensitive to many things. And we will see the screen characteristics, the alignment mechanism, internal and external, and, um, and the distribution of the main field in the line of sight. So uh, there, there, are, there, there are two parts in my talk. The, the first one mainly focuses on many fields. Uh, so the analysis of the many field thanks to dust pollution maps. And the second part focuses on dust grain characteristics and more like the characteristics of the, of the grain size, shape, and the grain alignment mechanism. And how can we use Sophia Hopper's data to constrain this mechanism and dust properties? All right. So. First part, uh, how to analyze and study many fields with, uh, with SOFIA data. So I will start to, uh, with the presentation of this method already uh, touched base by Martin, uh, the DCF method, Davis and Shara-Sekar-Femi method that allows to, to have an estimation of the many field strength in the, in the plane of the sky. So it uh, relies on the Alvin relation, which equates the fluctuation of the transverse uh, ve ve velocity with the turbulent component of the transverse uh, magnetic field. It has different assumptions or caveats that it assumed that the original, uh, this e equation assumed that it, you, you are in a incompressible media. However, the ISM turbulence is highly uh, compressible. Uh, the rotation of the, um, the main field must not be too close on the line of sight. And uh, it is also um, only um, valid in the trans to sub cases. It also assumes isotropic turbulence because uh, we'll see that you, you relate, uh, you use this equation uh, using the planar sky fluctuation of the main field with the line of sight fluctuation in velocity. And uh, so if, if we assume that the, 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 the turbulent component of the magnetic field is small compared to the underlying component, then we can approximate this ratio to the local dispersion of magnetic field, so polarization angle, and one could estimate the total magnetic field uh, strength uh, in the plane of the sky uh, with this equation. So however, one must be really cautious using the, this method in regions 
that are uh, uh, self-gravitating because gravity will affect the, um, the small and large scale component of the magnetic field and will not uh, and, uh, and, and the ratio here will not be uh, only uh, dependent on the velocity fl fluctuations. Other update, uh, updates has been proposed on this method and when could uh, generally people are using a lot of these um, updates or comparing them when trying to assume the magnetic field strength, the, 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 the P-field uh, strength. One update is proposed here uh, that uh, in, uh, when the turbulence is uh, highly compressible, you actually have another relation which relates, which relates the magnetic field with the square root of the local dispersion in polarization angles. And um, uh, another example showing the, maybe the caveats of this method has been highlighted here when comparing the Zeeman line of sight magnetic field with the DCF inferred plane of the sky magnetic field. It has been shown that uh, the, um, the, 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 there may be a systematic overestimation of the magnetic field in the DCF method, and uh, especially toward the, um, the region, uh, uh, it, especially toward a high density region, so where the gravity starts to, to, to enter in, into account. But I would say that the most widely uh, method uh, to, to, um, to estimate the field strength with polarization maps is the angular dispersion function method. So it's um, <clears throat> it is the analysis of the structure function of the of the magnetic field in the plane of sky in all the map, and um, and fitting this function shown here uh, allows to characterize the ratio of the turbulent to organized component of, of the magnetic field. So basically, um, <clears throat> the the two point uh, dispersion function is computed which is here delta phi is the uh, typical difference of polarization angle between two points separated by distance L. So you compute this function in all, in the, on a given region, and then you fit your function as, as you, you fit this function as a function of L with this analytical formula that uh, contain the number of turbulent cells, the correlation length, the bin widths, and the large scale component. And using uh, the, this, uh, this result, you can estimate the, the plane of sky mainly field strength using the same idea as the, the DCS method. Several other updates have, have been proposed, and uh, I, in, in, in particular, Pilai Lal 2015, Pato also, and uh, more recently, the differential measure approach has been, uh, has been proposed. I'll not, I'll not, uh, I'll not uh, discuss this here. So an example of the of such method is a, is a shown in this slide, where um, the ADS method has been computed in Orion KL using Sophia Hockplus data. So the idea is to is to um, apply this method uh, toward a subregion of the map, a subregion having high enough dynamical range between the angular resolution and the the, the size of the kernel size. Uh, of, of, the, of the kernel, uh, highlighted here by the different colors uh, of, uh, of, of, of circles. So the idea is to uh, compute this function, this angular dispersion function, in every kernel size, in every kernel region, and fit this to have an estimation of the magnetic field. And then you can build a map of magnetic field strength if, if you have a uh, high enough that dynamic range between again largest spatial scales and angular resolution, and the the the, the result of this is shown here uh, for the RMC one region. So in fine, uh, one one could uh, use this method to to investigate different things: the the magnetic field versus gas density relation, the the ratio between magnetic field and turbulence and gravity, and investigate the the sub super or uh, sub criticality of course and uh, the real, the real state of dense of dense structures for example now i'll uh, present another method which is called the density gradient so originally this method 
have been uh, developed onto Planck data, so polarization map of the diffuse ISM and molecular clouds. The idea here is to compute the difference in angles between the gradients in, of total intensity or column density and with the, the local magnetic field orientation. And this is called the, here I show an histogram of this related orientation uh, for different, <clears throat> for different uh, column density regions. And uh, one can see that uh, there is a shift between um, alignment between low to dense gas. In low density gas, so diffuse ISM, the, the main fields are mainly parallel to the gradients. In dense gas, corresponding to molecular clouds, here shown uh, in the acrid region, the, the main fields are mainly perpendicular to the gradients. So it's really a tool to quantify what's the, um, what's the morphology of the main field with respect to the morphology of the, of the density structures. And estimators has been developed to quantify this relative alignment, mainly this one and this one. So basically, if this estimator is positive or negative, so it, it, if it is negative, um, the, the main field are perpendicular to the gradients, and if it is positive, they are parallel. And a systematic decrease has been shown as a function of column density. This shows that um, <clears throat> mo molecular cloud seems to be, uh, uh, the, the main axis of, of molecular cloud seems to be uh, uh, typically uh, perpendicular to uh, the ambient magnetic field. It shows, it tells us something about how molecular clouds are forming, namely. What's interesting is that there is a change in this um, relation uh, as a function of the, of the magnetic field strength. And especially, we are interested here in the density where we see a transition between positive to negative. So this transition mainly, uh, refers to the density where the magnetic field starts to be uh, perpendicular to the density st structures. And it occurs, and, and, and the, the density, the, uh, uh, this transition density occurs at um, lower density for higher magnetization in those simulation. So comparing this uh, transition density uh, can be interesting uh, to, to actually quantify the, the, the relative role of many fields from cloud to cloud. And what is, what is uh, interesting for Sofia is that Sofia constrained the large density uh, range, uh, space size of this diagram. And so it can be, this method can be used with Sofia data in conjunction with Planck data to, uh, to constrain this uh, critical density. Uh, now, now I'll uh, really show an example of, 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 this, of the such method at small scales that uses intensity gradient, but also velocity structures. So here we look at the serpent south uh, low mass star forming region. Here on the left, it is a, a column density map showing all the polar stars, um, which are star forming cores uh, in, in the region. So it's, it's uh, consist in the large scale uh, main filament. And along this filament, we see a clear uh, gradients in velocity. So here, this is the moment one of N2H plus, and this seems to be a converging flow from the outskirt toward the interior of the of the filament. And what's in, and and uh, the the green vector highlights the the, the fact I was just mentioning that uh, the main axis of the cloud se seems to to be. Um, perpendicular to the large scale magnetic field, telling us something on, on how do they form. However, at smaller scales, Sophia revealed that the magnetic field gets realigned. Uh, in, and this realignment is induced by uh, converging flows of matter along the filament axis. This is, this is illustrated here in this uh, 2D, 2D diagram. Uh, where the difference in angles between the main field and the filament main axis is shown 
as a function of uh, extension, so column density. And this realignment <coughs> uh, is shown here, where uh, the, 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 the domain field in the low density region here is dragged, is uh, is dragged toward the, the the main gravitational potential. So this example is um, really highlights the highlights what could be done with Sophia Leita to investigate how uh, dense cores are formed and what is the role of many field in funneling material towards star, star forming cores. Now I would like to briefly touch base on the multi-scale uh, capability of, um, of, the, of using Sophia as well as other polar emitters. On the left hand side, I show an example of combining starlight, po starlight polarization and Sophia data. So the starlight po polarization are ideal to look at the diff to look at the uh, large scale component of the main field around a core or around a cloud where the extension is low, such as we can see background stars. And Sophia data shown in uh, in orange here uh, show the orientation of the main field in the in the in the small scales towards the core so it, it really highlights the capability the, the the fact that the the main field has evolved in direction from large scale to small scales induced by the the collapse the different velo velocity component uh, that developed al along the collapse another example of, of synergy is between alma and hopeless so on the top uh, diagram i show plus observation in polarization of the of the BYF uh, 73 high mass core that had been also observed with ALMA in polarization. And uh, this really shows how uh, the, the role of the magnetic field can be observed, can be analyzed with um, at, at two different scales, at scales of the formation of the dense cores and at the scales where uh, streamer structures develop uh, uh, induced by the by the gravitational collapse. Now, uh, one thing I would like to to briefly touch base on is another way of studying the polarization. The the, the idea is to use uh, the information of the main field we have in the plane of the sky with the one that we have in the line of sight. So, if we calculate the dispersion of, of polarization angle in a plane of the sky, we have an idea of the uh, how, of how disorganized is the magnetic field in a plane of the sky. And same with the polarization fraction, we can um, analyze how disorganized is the magnetic field in a plane of the sky, in the line of sight, sorry. And so the higher the disorganization of the magnetic field is, the, the higher is S and the lower is P frac. And this, uh, so analyzing both S and P frac tells us uh, something about the 3D structures of the magnetic field, and the Planck data uh, model have a, a Planck model have a, has developed a, so a, a model to 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 and to to understand this uh, relation, simulating or mimicking a multi uh, a turbulent field uh, uh, with a multi layered uh, component, each one consisting of uh, a, a local magnetic field and Gaussian fl fl fluctuation. And they have shown that the S and P frac are related and are inversely proportional. And uh, depending also on the on this parameter here, which relates to the turbulent state of the gas. And I'd like to briefly to, to show two examples of, of such study here, of, you, of uh, looking at uh, the relation between S and P frac in uh, protostar here, comparing um, uh, Alma data with Planck data, and on the right hand side here toward uh, the the orion molecular cloud uh, using Hopkins data. So comparing this relation with the scales with medium can be interesting uh, to investigate the, the the three D structures of the magnetic field. Another thing that uh, the this relation is sensitive to is the line of sight uh, or it, the angle between the magnetic field and the line of sight because uh, the, the, the closer is the magnetic field from the line of sight, 
and the higher is the apparent fluctuation of polarization angle in the planet sky. So the higher is S. And, um, and this, uh, ha this can be used to, uh, to quantify the relation between the line of sight, the planet of sky magnetic field, in order to correct the, um, the planet of sky magnetic field uh, calculated by the DCF method. And I show here also on the right uh, of the example of simulation highlighting the um, this effect of the angle of the magnetic field in the line of sight on the mean value of s and on the slope of uh, s versus p frac uh, correlation. Now I don't have a lot of time here. Yeah, I mean I do have time, but I will just briefly mention two things before going. Uh, before passing on the um, dust uh, properties. So one method is the velocity gradient method. This idea of this method is that um, turbulence ADs in the, in the ISM get organized uh, such that velocity fl fluctuation are maximum where the, um, when they are perpendicular to the magnetic field. So analyzing velocity gradients in the gas uh, with respect to the polarization from the thermal emission can be an, a tool to, to quantify whether we are in a turbulent medium or dominated uh, by a gravitational collapse, uh, in which case the, the angle between uh, gradients and magnetic field must change. And this is an example here uh, for 30 door in the LMC. So basically, you, you build the PPV the diagram and you compute uh, the, the the local gradient in velocity and, and you integrate in line of sight and you construct a, a local gradient in uh, in, in, in velocity. Uh, however, one must be cautious to 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 use the proper gas traces uh, gas tracer that would match the medium traced by the dust thermal emission. And finally. The KTH method developed by Koch uh, in, in 2012. This method uh, also gives you an estimate of the magnetic field, but must be used only in a specific region, um, namely uh, where the small turbulent to ordered, to ordered field uh, ratio is uh, is small. So basically, where the, the gravitational uh, potential or yeah, the gravitational potential is strong with respect to to turbulence. And also the where the magnetic field is strong with respect to turbulence. So you looking at different um, part of the, the different elements of the map, one can constrain the magnetic field. So basically, uh, this method uses the angle between the intensity gradient and the gravitational potential, uh, the angle between the polarization and the intensity gradient, and using the the gradient in thermal pressure here and uh, the gravitational potential, as well as the curvature of the B field lines, one can construct the, the, the B field. This is this data, I th this method I think has a good potential for, for Sophia data, because most of the time Sophia data targets uh, dense clouds uh, dominated by gravity. All right, um, now I'll move on this uh, second part, I'll try to be short, um, which is, the study of dust characteristics and grain alignment with Sophia data. Uh, so, so far in this uh, presentation, we have assumed that dust grains were aligned with the magnetic field. It is actually via this grain alignment mechanism called the radiative alignment torques. Uh, so dust grains basically align the angular momentum axis with respect to be to the lines of, of the magnetic field, thanks to interaction between uh, a radiation field and the, um, the dust grains via the radiative torques applied by the photons on the grains. And um, studying uh, this mechanism or this, the, the, the observational like traces of this mechanism can tell us something about the size, shape and composition and composition of those grains. And therefore it, it can be a tool to, to, to to characterize those properties. One can also try to, uh, to, uh, de to detect other mechanisms, such as the k rats mechanism. This time, grains align the main axis, align the angular momentum axis with the radiation field direction. 
And this can be, for example, studied with Sophia data, because as it is sensitive to hot dust, <clears throat> so dust subject to a high irradiation field in the far infrared, uh, one could try to detect this, uh, this mechanism in uh, irradiated regions such as PDRs or H2 regions. And finally, grains can also, uh, in theory, align the main axis with the direction of the main gas dust drift. It's called the mechanical al alignment mechanism. And uh, this such mechanism can be investigated and, and targeted, for example, in the envelope of AGB stars, where the gas dust drift is high. <clears throat> But one thing to like concretely in the data, what, what could we do? Well, the idea is to compare the polarization fraction with the different quantities, stock size, column density, dust temperature. And from this relation, we can infer uh, several, several things about the, the conditions, the gray alignment, and the dust properties. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so here I show an example of, um, of a SOFIA study led toward 30 door again. And um, you can see here that the polarization fraction relation as a function of stocks I is different um, uh, among different medium, right? Here toward the, des toward, toward the densest place and, and here uh, toward less dense regions. And uh, this uh, behavior is, can, can be explained by different things. The relative importance of the evolution of grain alignment as a function of density, but also the relative importance of the magnetic field disorganization as a function of density. Such slope can be compared to models to constrain these two things. Another, prediction, another thing to, to, to investigate is the relation between the polarization fraction and the dust temperature. The theory of the rats, so the, the theory of the grain alignment uh, predicting alignment of the grains with the many field lines predicts uh, also that the polarization fraction should increase with dust temperature. Uh, sorry, I just, just have a pop up window on my on my Mac, I'm just gonna quit. Do you see it or not? I have a pop-up window. Yeah, yes, yes, we see, see it. it. Okay, uh, just. Well. Anyway. You got uh, rid of it now. Yeah. All right, so I was saying that, yeah, uh, the, usually you, you're supposed to see an increase of the polarization fraction with respect to dense temperature. And when it departs from it, uh, people have, been, have proposed that such departures, so such decrease of the polarization fraction with respect to uh, the dense temperature can be explained by the, the fact that large grains could disrupt themselves if they are, get, if they are gaining too much rotational speed with respect to their own cohesion strength. So analyzing such um, behavior, such relation, can tell us something about the, the, the maximum dust grain size or the, and, and therefore the, the, the possibility that the larger grains get destroyed at, at high temperature. And the several models and theories have been tried to reproduce such data and uh, um, an example is shown here uh, with this uh, two uh, uh, diagram showing the evolution of the polarization as a function of wavelengths for different conditions of irradiation and with or without the mechanism di disrupting the, the, the largest grains. And so it, it, it can be clearly seen here that the, um, uh, the, the polarization fraction drops um, at uh, fine infrared and some millimeter wavelengths, the polarization fraction drops with higher irradiation, whereas it was the opposite where no disruption of the largest grains was implemented. So it's, uh, so in comparing such models with the, such relation can tell us something about indeed the largest aligned grains 
and therefore constraining the dust grain size distribution in a given medium, which is a very important thing to, 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 to analyze. Speaking about polarization, polarization spectra, uh, I think there is also a, a very nice synergy between hot plus and other telescopes, such as JCMT Paul 2, for, for example, looking at the polarization in the, in the sub millimeter. And I show here an example of such study comparing two bands of Sophia with uh, JCMT Paul 2 polarization toward uh, a dense core in Orion. And uh, so this uh, study has compared different dust grain models with the, 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 the 2D correlation um, of the polarization interaction at multi wavelengths. So the, the model fit is not that good, but actually it just opened the, the floor to such study and there'll be more and more data um, <clears throat> from the, from the semi-millimeter te telescopes and uh, more and more comparison with SOFIA data will be possible and um, <clears throat> and also will open the floor to, the, to developing new models, um, uh, predicting the polarization spectra as a function of the irradiation and those green properties, as well as green line and mechanism. Here, I just yeah, I just like to show another example of uh, polarization polarization spectra in the fine infrared and some millimeter. On the right hand side here. Those are obtained toward uh, star, star toward the uh, nearby galaxies, and uh, a more uh, old uh, result <clears throat> uh, towards molecular cloud has been uh, has suggested that the the shape of the polarization spectra in the fine infrared can be explained by um, by for, for example a dust temperature gradient in line of sight or having two different components of dust. Um, one being hot and one being uh, one being of lar larger colder dust, being more emissive, more emissive in the uh, in the millimeter. So this uh, shows an example of what could be studied uh, with uh, combining hot plus data with uh, some millimeter polarization capabilities, and which are Alma, JCMT Pol two, Nika two Pol, which is coming in at the RM thirty meter. One and three and one and three millimeter wavelengths, and also the LMT to Toltec instrument is coming in coming years, I think, um, which also will target uh, millimeter uh, polarization. And I think that's uh, two last thing I would like to, to, to touch base on, which is the how to constrain dust evolution models or dust evolution in. Uh, with the SOFIA observation. And one thing I mentioned previously was the maximum grain size, which is affected by the description of dust. But actually, we can also constrain the growth of dust in dense cold media where the irradiation field is, is not high, such that there is no disruption, such, such as filament uh, or dense cores with, without feedback. Because actually, the right theory predicts that uh, the alignment efficiency depends on the grain size. And the more embedded you are in a cloud, the larger the grains will be susceptible to alignment. Because you need photons with wavelengths is uh, on the order of the grain size to align the grains. So analyzing the evolution of um, the gray element efficiency with local gas density, therefore extension, gives you an idea of what is the maximum grain size in your environment. And this on the left-hand side is um, an example of a study looking at this in uh, a quiescent uh, infrared dark cloud uh, uh, where they, they they compare the polarization fraction with an analytical formula of the minimum size of line grains. And the EDIN showed that the, pol the polarization increases for a smaller, for decreasing minimum size of line grains, which means uh, for more, uh, for more line grains in the line of sight. So this opens the floor to investigating dust grain growth 
um, in the end course, where the again where the, where the temperature uh, is a uh, is not that hot. And finally, which is yeah, this is my uh, last slide. Um, I would like to to mention this uh, code. It's called Polaris. It's a polarization radiative transfer code. Uh, so you run it on an MHD simulation, and you you um, it implements the different different dust grain alignment theories. Not all of them, but yet it is a very strong tool to compare and interpret Sophia hopeless data. And I think uh, it has not been used that much so far to interpret Sophia data. And I think it has a strong potential. Uh, and um, the idea would be, for example, to compare the, the, the 2D correlation I've mentioned before, the, um, the project of S and PFRAG, the polarization, the polarization, fr fr the polarization fraction spectra. And this would, in turn, um, um, constrain the grain properties, maximum grain size, so uh, affected by the growth and the disruption. This also can constrain the composition, the shape, and the um, alignment properties of grains. If one would uh, implement such things in the um, polarized code to, to match the observation. Here is just an example of the use of Polaris to reproduce ALMA, ALMA polarization observation of, uh, of course. So we just like to show that, yeah, this is a, a this would be a thing very interesting to do uh, toward uh, filaments, dense cores, or molecular cloud observed with Sophia. And uh, here we go. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much for this great talk, Valentin, and questions. I don't see any question in the chat. We have plenty of time for questions. Don't hesitate and ask your questions. Oh, I think Richard has a question. Uh, Richard? I can try to unmute you if you want. Hello? Now I think you can speak. Go ahead, Richard, you're unmuted. Um, actually, actually, we don't hear you, Richard. Maybe type in the chat, maybe? Oh, yeah, okay. That would be better. I think we actually just heard you. Oh, darn it. Yeah, you're, you're here, you're now. Okay. Uh, I, will all this information be posted? Do they say where it would be posted uh, next week? We'll be sending everyone out an email, and we will give you the links to where everything will be posted. It will be on the Sophia School website. Okay, that was all the quit. I missed that earlier. Sorry. No problem. All right. Uh, Bill, you have a question? Hey there. Uh, Val, one of the sort of dirty secrets about doing this this type of observation is that for, for the ground-based and SOFIA-based is that you're, they're differential measurements. So uh, like the observations of comparing polarization uh, at different angular scales, it, there's, the, there's the hidden problem of the large scale contribution to the polarization because I know when when looking at a plank map covering degrees you can have some overall direction of the of the polarization and then if you want to get if one wants to compare that to a smaller scale map that's been chopped then already something has been subtracted I wonder if um because I haven't thought about this problem in a few years I wonder if you have any any thoughts about how one deals with that nasty hidden question. Uh, 
<laughs> well, that's um, that's a problem that indeed um, is super important. Um, uh, it's hard for me to, to answer this, this, this question because it really concerns every single thing I have said concerning uh, the analysis of the magnetic field. In estimating the B, the B field strength, the, also the, the, the density gradients, um, you, you really are sensitive to different kind of medium with Sophia compared to Planck indeed. Um, so yeah, I would say that maybe the, the thing I would I would propose each time is to have, is to try to compare polarization observation with models. I mean, it's complicated sometimes because you need to develop image simulation, but it really tells us, tells you something about what is the, the large scale component you may, you may miss. And I, this is the only way, which is, I think the most robust way to deal, to deal with this problem. The large scale component cannot be recovered at all, uh, when you don't have, uh, indeed, uh, information about it in the observation and uh, reproducing it, reproducing the large scale component in simulation, uh, mimicking the, the, the properties of the medium uh, can be uh, can be told to, to do it. I also mentioned like different, different, um, different things. Like if, if you look at this uh, such analysis, uh, you were really analyzing the mining field at different scales independently, which means that you look you look at the large scales with with respect to you, you look at the large scale B field with respect to the large scale density structures, and and, and so on at alma scales, and you just you discuss them together, but you don't link them together quantitatively. And I think this is maybe more robust and and, uh, and cautious. Okay. But again, yeah, comparing this, for example, this scaling relations with a, with a, a multi-scale MHD simulation is crucial to, to allow strong conclusions. Okay. Uh, we have also a question in the chat from Tom Steinmetz. And he's, he asked, how important are, are such tests of dust alignment that you discussed when doing stellar SED modeling rather than mapping than the magnetic field itself? And the following says, like, this may be a stupid question, which is not, but I'm new to polarization studies, so my apologies if this is the case. Uh, I'll just st stop sharing and, and read the question myself. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I, I understand it completely. Um, I, I don't see the, the question doing stellar SAD modeling. What, what's the link between stellar SAD modeling and the... I, I think I might offer possible part answer here, uh, which is for um, far infrared polarimetry, the, it's mainly the large dust grains that count, and and there the SEDs are abroad. Um, if you go to very short wavelengths where you probe the smallest dust grains, the SEDs uh, do change, but that would be more optical and UV polarimetry where you're probing only the very smallest grains. Does that make sense to you, Val, as a, as a response? No, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. I just didn't know if it, if, uh, if it was a reference to starlight polarization of multi-wavelengths or if it was a reference to just uh, uh, fitting a, a SED of a star, uh, taking into account the foreground uh, extension. Uh, Tom, why don't you unmute and, and we can have that discussion if, yeah, unless the question was answered. Yeah, of course. Uh, sorry about that. Um, sorry for the slight confusion in the question. But so it more refers to the so the study that I'm going to be undertaking in the future is to do with it is basically um, a cool, dusty envelope surrounding a, a cool star. And the idea of the study is basically to um, derive the exact dust properties. Um, we the problem is we don't know a lot about the magnetic field of the system. 
So for me personally, I don't know the exact impact that it would have. And therefore, I don't know whether it would be either feasible or worth the time to do such tests on uh, dust grain alignment and, you know, try and probe in more depth into this. So that was kind of more of the question about, um, you know, in your experience, um, and this was maybe more of an open question, but does in, in these kind of situations where you're modeling the SED um, and trying to derive, you know, dust grain sizes, um, the whether they're silicates or organics or things like this, whether such tests are actually needed? Um, yeah, I think that um, modeling both the total intensity SED as well as the SED of the polarization fraction, if you have multiple wavelengths polarization, is a very good tool to constrain further your dust grain models. And, and several studies have, have, have used this. I've used this extra information you have from polarization because you can uh, as you can assume a model for grain alignment as a, function of, as a function of size, and then you can constrain your dust properties, silicate proportion or uh, or, or, or grain uh, composition, etc. Uh, uh, and this, once you have fixed the parameter uh, for the grain alignment model, uh, gets you extra information uh, about your grains than if you were just to have the total intensity, total intensity um, SED. And there I see you have a, a raised hand. Oh, I was just going to comment on, um, so the, that's, I think Valentin makes a great point in that the dust, the dust polarimetry spectrum gives you uh, an extra handle on grain properties. Uh, but if, if I understood the question, Tom, like you're worried about um, taking your say Stokes I spectrum and, and, and thinking about how it's polarized, and typically, we we don't we don't worry about correcting for polarization vari variation at least in the far infrared. That hasn't really been done when doing just straight SEDs. Um, it, it's you figure the polarizations are kind of usually at most ten percent polarized, and the variation of polarization across the the far infrared is lower than that. So um, that's typically not dominant. It's more dominated by the uncertainties and the flux measurements than it would be in variations in polarization as you um, go across the SED. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I figured. Yeah, that. no, that's quite helpful. Thank you. It's, it's. I think it's my slight lack of experience in this field. I just wanted to try and get more of an insight. That was all. But thank you, both of you. Okay, uh, that's great. Um, maybe we can move to next speaker, David. Choose from Villanova University.